Um, as I said, there was a relationship between the detention and interrogation policies in Northern Ireland. Um, in Northern Ireland, they used the euphemism for um, some of their practices as inter interrogation in depth. And it included all kinds of things. The, the five techniques included such things as hooding and sleep deprivation and, and noise um, sensory uh, in problems. But um, the government even acknowledged uh, at various points that these practices were adopted as a policy of the government. What we saw though was that it, it didn't stop with those practices. What happened was because the rule of law, because of the sense of emergency, uh, the, the state of emergency, and the failure to hold those accountable at all levels of government who, who uh, allowed these practices, it sent a, a, a signal to the people in, uh, who were actually doing the interrogation. And so what happened was you had these low-level officers who got the message that we're in a state of emergency and we got to do everything we can to get this information. They went beyond even the five uh, techniques that uh, had been, uh, although they were uh, found to be inhumane and cruel by the UK versus Ireland case, um, they were uh, practiced by the, the, um, the, the government for some time, but it went beyond even that. Um, the, the evidence of it, it, people not being held accountable continued into the 90s. Um, there was a, the Independent Commission on Complice, Police Complaints was formed to examine um, allegations of mistreatment and interrogation. And during that three year period, there were 1,118 allegations of misconduct. Um, and they didn't sustain a single allegation. Now, you could take that to mean, well, then there, were no, there was no misconduct during the interrogations, but um, non-governmental examinations of interrogation policies didn't um, demonstrate that that was true. Um, there were groups such as Amnesty International that looked at medical evidence of trauma that occurred, physical trauma that occurred during interrogation, and um, they found such things as bruising, abrasion, swelling, perforated eardrums, broken bones. So, you know, there is evidence that there was affirmative um, physical violence going on during the interrogations. Um, the practices were found to be, um, to really have a persistent effect. So for years after, um, for example, the civilian control over internment was put in place, um, the legitimacy of the, the system was, was not um, accepted by the targeted community, which as Professor O'Connor said, that was the community that the government most needed to bring into cooperation because they would have the most information about who was involved and who was planning to do violence. And, and so it had that counter, um, you know, counter effect. Um, there were many things that we looked in in Northern Ireland, but the bottom line with what we saw in Northern Ireland is that, that we could learn a lot from what the British government had tried to do there, what worked, what didn't work, and um, what has been frustrating um, as someone who looked at this before uh, we were in Northern Ireland in the 90s uh, looking at this, and, and our article came out in 2003, um, to see how many of the mistakes that were in fact uh, perpetrated in trying to fight political violence or terrorism, Northern Ireland have been repeated here. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Mm. All right, I'll start. Oh, I think you have to wait for the mic.
Well, one thing that I've recently seen in Northern Ireland is there is a, a move towards a uh, truth type commission where there is some opportunity for um, uh, you know, truth and reconciliation as opposed to criminal prosecution for those who were involved in some of these um, abhorrent hacks on both sides, uh, both governmental agents and um, uh, members of terrorist organizations. I don't know how far that's gotten in Northern Ireland. Um, I know that it is fairly recent. Uh, one, one um, on your, your comment about uh, Britain's uh, uh, decision to um, say that terrorism uh, would not be considered uh, an act of war. What's interesting about what occurred in Northern Ireland is that was, in fact, um, greatly resisted by the IRA. Um, in fact, the, 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 that was part of what they call, uh, the Labor Party introduced the criminalization policy. Uh, and the hunger strikes in which uh, 10 IRA uh, and INLA uh, prisoners starved themselves to death and another 60 approximately were on hunger strike when, when the strikes were broken by uh, a combination of the Catholic Church and the families of the hunger strikers who were beginning to force feed them when they would go, become unconscious. Um, they were hunger striking over the very issue of treating terrorism as a crime instead of as war. Uh, and their uh, mantra was basically that um, you are, are, are taking 800 years of, of armed struggle and calling it a crime. Uh, so it's a very interesting um, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, difference to um, uh, the kind of the, the other side of the coin of, of, of calling a war on terror. They were, uh, in fact, um, hopeful of it being a, a war on terror. Um.